Hello and welcome to a discussion on the gastrointestinal tract histology. We're going to look at the histology from the esophagus all the way down to the anal canal. The oral cavity will be discussed in a separate video. So will be the organs associated with the GIT, that is the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. So to begin with, the walls of the GI tract are essentially going to have four layers. From the lumen going outside, we're going to find the mucosa, then the submucosa, then we find the muscularis externa, then we find adventitia or cirrhosa, depending on whether an organ is retroperitoneal or intraperitoneal, respectively. The mucosa essentially will have three layers. There will be the epithelium, which mostly in the GI tract is going to be simple columnar. Then below the epithelium, remember epithelium is avascular, you expect to find loose connective tissue. The loose connective tissue will be the lamina propria. And beneath the lamina propria, we expect to find a muscularis interna, which can also be called the muscularis mucosa. Within the lamina propria, we find glands. Right? Then the submucosa will have dense connective tissue. And within the submucosa, you find a masonous plexus of nerves, also called the submucosal plexus of nerves. This plexus of nerves is going to be part of um, the enteric nervous system. And if you look at the duodenum and the esophagus, you're also going to find glands within the submucosa. Then the next layer will be the muscularis externa, which is an outer longitudinal layer and an inner circular layer. But in certain regions of the stomach, you find an almost circular layer of smooth muscle, which you're going to call an inner oblique layer. Then the last layer will be your adventitia or cirrhosa, depending on whether you are retroperitoneal or intraperitoneal, as I alluded to earlier on. Right. Then to begin with, the esophagus, the epithelium is going to be stratified squamous epithelium. And for the purposes of humans, it's going to be non-keratinized. But if you look at the other lower animals that take a rough diet, the epithelium will actually have a bit of keratinization. For the purposes of the humans, we may find keratohyaline granules in the apical cells, but generally it remains um, a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Right. Then, like I said, the glands, which are known as the esophageal cardiac, esophageal glands, rather, we find them in the submucosa. But towards the cardiac of the stomach, we find esophageal cardiac glands that are going to be located within the mucosa, the lamina propria, and they're going to resemble the glands that we find in the cardiac of the stomach. Right. Then if you look at um, the smooth muscle or the muscularis external layer, the upper third is going to be striated muscle, that's going to be skeletal muscle. The middle third is a mixture of striated and smooth muscle, and the lower third has purely smooth muscle. Right. And the outer layer for the esophagus mostly is going to be adventitia, ex except for the abdominal part of the esophagus, which is about 1.25 centimeters, where you're going to find cirrhosa. Right. And um, on one of the slides, I'm going to show you the esophageal gastric junction, where there's an abrupt change of epithelium from the stratified squamous that we find in the esophagus to the simple columnar epithelium that we expect to find in the stomach, right? So basically the stomach has four parts. You remember it is a cardia. You find the fundus, you find the body, then you find the pylorus. The cardia and the pylorus resemble each other histologically, whereas the fundus and the body will also resemble each other uh, histologically. The lining cells of the lumen of the stomach will be a simple columnar epithelium, which can also be referred to as surface mucus cells. These surface mucus cells will have a turnover rate of four to seven days, right? And it's a homogeneous epithelium in the sense that you don't expect to find goblet cells within the epithelium of the stomach, as opposed to the heterogeneous type of epithelium that we're going to find in the small intestines, right? And within the stomach, you find folds of submucosa and mucosa, which you call rugae. The rugae are not going to be permanent, and they're going to disappear when the stomach is fully distended or full. Unlike the valves of Keckring or the plica secularis, if you may call them, that you find in the small intestines that are going to be permanent folds of the very same submucosa 
and the mucosa. Right. The epithelial lining within the stomach invaginates inward and you form what are known as gastric pits. It invaginates into the lamina propria. And the gastric pits, uh, they open into the stomach lumen above and they lead into the gastric glands below. These gastric pits are going to be deeper in the pyloric region of the stomach. Right. And the gastric glands that you find in this lamina propria, if you look at the cardia and the pylorus that I said they're the same histologically, the glands are going to be uh, branched tubular glands. Then if you look at the fundus in the body, the glands are going to be simple tubular glands. But generally, as a general rule, the cardia and the pylorus, the glands, they will lack parietal and chief cells. There'll be a predominant or a predominance of anterior endocrine cells and um, the mucus neck cells, right? But other texts will say you find few parietal cells and chief cells, right? So basically the four major cell types that you find in the gastric glands are the parietal cells, also known as the oxyntic cells. Then you have the chief cells, also known as the zymogenic cells. Then you have the mucus neck cells, then you have the anterior endocrine cells. The parietal cells renew after about 150 to 200 days. Then the chief cells and the anterior endocrine cells, they renew after about 90 to 120 days. Whereas the mucus neck cells have a renewal rate almost the same as the surface mucus cells that are lining the lumen of the stomach, which is around six days. The parietal cells are specialized for acid production and they also produce intrinsic factor, which is necessary for binding vitamin B12 and allowing it to be absorbed. They're highly eosinophilic due to the abundance of mitochondria, because remember you want to pump acid against a lumen into the stomach, into a lumen that is already rich in acid. So you're pumping against the gradient. Right? Then an active uh, parietal cell will be characterized by less tubular vesicles because you have um, released the proton pumps to the membrane, but there is an abundance of intracellular canaliculars on the apical membrane. Within those intracellular canaliculi, you find microvilli. Right? The nucleus is going to be central and it's going to be rounded. And in some cases, you may find your parietal cells to have two nuclei. Right? The cells are going to be pyramidal to rounded, and they're mainly in the upper half of the gastric glands. The cells that you find mainly in the basis of the gastric glands, they're going to be the chief cells. The chief cells would mainly produce pepsinogen as well as gastric lipers. And they have characteristics of protein secreting cells or protein synthesizing cells. So they're highly basophilic due to the presence of um, abundant rough endoplasmic reticulum. But towards the apical end, they become a bit eosinophilic due to the presence of the zymogenic granules, which actually store the, the enzymes to be secreted. Then the nucleus is euchromatic, which is the same as a parietal cell, to show that the DNA is actively being transcribed. And these cells, like I said, they're mostly found in the bases of the gastric glands. Then you have the mucus neck cells, which are less colamina as compared to the surface mucus cells. Those mucus neck cells, they produce a less alkaline secretion as compared to the surface mucus cells. Then you have the anterior endocrine cells, which are part of the diffuse neuroendocrine system. Those anterior endocrine cells of importance, you talk about the G cells, which are mainly in the pylorus of the stomach. Those G cells will produce gastrin. And one of the functions of gastrin is to stimulate the parietal cells to produce acid. Other stimulators, you'd of course talk about things like acetylcholine uh, in the parasympathetic pathway. Right. And you may have um, gastrinomas or zollinger ellison syndrome where the G cells within the pancreas or even the small intestines, they start to produce too much of the gastrin and you overstimulate your parietal cells and they produce too much of the acid. Right. That's a gastrinoma or a uh, zollinger ellison uh, syndrome. Right. Moving on. The small intestines, they're, they're going to be made up of the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The epithelium remains a simple columnar epithelium, 
And like I said, you have permanent folds known as valves of Kirkling, where you have mucosa and submucosa. These plica circularis, um, they actually get depleted, depleted as you go down a small bowel, such that the ileum will have interspersed uh, plica circularis. The lamina propria within the small intestines, it extends into the epithelium, uh, forming what are known as villi. Right? The villi that you find in the jejunum, they're going to be more or less uh, finger-shaped or tongue-shaped. Right? And the villi in the duodenum and the ileum, they're going to be leaf-shaped. That's how you differentiate the two under the light microscope. Right? Glands in the intestines are mainly in the lamina propria and they are simple tubular glands. But for the purposes of the duodenum, remember we said the glands are going to be mainly found in the submucosa. Those glands are going to be called Brunner's glands and they are branched tubular glands. Right. Then the openings into the glands, they lie between two villi. Right. If you look at the types of cells that you find in the glands, you have the enterocyte, which is simple collamin and the absorptive cell. They have microvilli on the apical end, which are covered by a glycocalyx, right? And those microvilli, they lead to the appearance of a brush border or a striated border on the apical end of your enterocyte. That is going to be the same thing that we're going to talk about when we do the urinary system. If you look at the proximal convoluted tubules, they also show the presence of a brush border. These cells have abundant mitochondria on the basal end because you want to pump nutrients against the gradient into the blood. Then you've one known as panet cells, which are mainly in the base of the gland. They work in the innate immunity and they secrete lysozymes, phospholipase A2, and defenses. These panet cells may actually increase in certain pathologies. Then you've one known as microfold cells, which overlie pure species as well as lymphoid tissue. These cells are more collamina and they lack microvilli. Instead of having microvilli, they have microfolds, hence the name microfold cells. They can also be called the M cells. Then you find the goblet cells, which makes the epithelium in the small intestines a heterogeneous epithelium. Right. Then you also expect to find anterior endocrine cells, which are part of the diffuse neuroendocrine system. And that means uh, you can also talk about carcinoid, where you have uh, cells of the diffuse neuroendocrine system producing hormones in excess, particularly serotonin. Right. Then the ileal mucosa and submucosa is aggregates of lymphoid tissue called PS pages, which I'm going to show you uh, shortly in the slide uh, that I will project. Right. And if you look at the, there should be an equilibrium within the small intestines between the rate of apoptosis and shading uh, of senescent epithelial cells at the villa step, right? And the generation of new cells uh, in the crypt, right, to maintain tissue homeostasis. That means apoptosis of epithelial cells actually occurs within uh, or at the tip of the villas, right? Then moving further, the large intestines are characterized by leaking villi. They have an abundance of goblet cells because the goblet cells increase in number as you go down, right? But the microvilli are still going to be present. The absorptive cells are going to be the colonocytes. And smooth muscle, uh, if you look at the longitudinal bend uh, of smooth muscle in the, in the large intestines, it's going, to act, it's going to form three bends, which are going to be your tinea coli, right? And the epithelium change, epithelium change is to sort fight squamous and the anal canal. And remember, we talk about Hirschsprung's disease, which is congenital uh, megacolon or aganglionic megacolon as a result of failure of neural crystals to migrate to the wall of the intestine during embryonic development. Right. Then we also talk about tubular glands that are going to lie in the mucosa of um, the large intestines. Right. So. If you then look at, if you then look at the, the slides that actually show um, tissue in the GI tract, this is esophageal tissue. Right? This is the mucosa. Right? This is this whole thing here. This is mucosa. This here is the epithelium, which is stratified squamous. This here is the lamina propria. 
Right, so this is lamina propria. Then this is muscularis mucosa. Right. So this would be muscularis mucosa right here. Then this is the muscularis externa. Right. Then on the outside here, this is adventitia. So that's adventitia. This is muscularis externa. And all this, this is muscularis externa here. Right. As well as this, this is the longitudinal band of the smooth muscle. Right. This would be the circular layer, which is on the inside. Right. Um, If you look at this slide here, right, this also is um, striated muscle. So remember we said uh, in some parts of the esophagus, you find striated muscle. This is striated muscle. Yeah, this is striated muscle. This again is striated muscle. And this is smooth muscle at the center there, then striated on the ends. Right. Then if you look at the lower slide, this is the epithelium, which is stratified squamous. This is the epithelium. This is lamina propria. Then this is the muscularis mucosa. Right. Then these within the lamina propria, they are lymphocytes. So you have an abundance of lymphoid tissue in the upper in the upper GI tract and the lower GI tract. All these are going to be lymphocytes. Right. Then, like I said earlier on, I'll show a jun the junction between the esophagus and um, the stomach. This is the gastroesophageal junction here. Right. This is epithelium. This is epithelium. On the right here, this is the esophagus with stratified squamous epithelium. This here. This tissue here, this is going to be the muscularis mucosa. On the left side here, this is um, stomach tissue. Uh, that's the epithelium showing foldings, which are your gastric beads, the spaces. They lead into those glands there in the lamina propria, which are the gastric glands. And also all these, they're going to be gastric glands. At high magnification, these are the gastric pits. Those are gastric pits. And those gastric pits, they lead into the glands. These are the gastric glands. So these are gastric glands. That's a duct there. That's a duct right over there. That's a duct right over there. Those ducts will be draining the gastric glands. Right. If you come to this side, these here are the surface mucus cells. They appear later under the light microscope because the water soluble mucinogens would have been lost during tissue sectioning and mucins generally stain poor with um, H and D staining. So those are the surface mucus cells, right? That we say they have a turnover rate of about um, four to seven days, right? Then that's a gastric pit. That's a gastric pit right over there. And all this, this is lamina propria. Right. If you look at the lower slide, that's a duct, that's a duct over there. That's another duct, that's another duct. These are the glands here. So those are glands. Right. Those are glands. This is muscle. So this is part of the muscularis mucosa below the lamina propria where we have those glands. Right. Then this again is stomach tissue. This shows um, ruge, where you have a fold of the submucosa into the mucosa, right? So this is ruge, right? And this here is the submucosa. And notice the submucosa goes into uh, the mucosa. Right? Then this is the muscularis externa. Right. If you look at this, this still is stomach tissue. Those are gastric pits. 
right? And all these are glands. So all those there are glands. Then lower down there, that's muscularis, uh, muscularis uh, mucosa, right? Then all these, these are cardiac glands. That's a cardiac gland, right? And um, uh, what else can we see here? Yeah? Mm. Yeah, basically, these are the gastric glands. And then within those gastric glands, we have cells, which is said on the apical end, mostly it's parietal cells. On the basal end, mostly it's your, it's your chief cells, right? Then take a moment to pause and guess what kind of tissue this would be. Right. So this is actually duodenal tissue. This is duodenum. Right. This side you have the lumen. This side here, this is the mucosa. That's the epithelial lining. That's the lamina propria within. Right. And this band here, this is muscularis mucosa. Then those are the glands that are mainly in the submucosa, your brunous glands. Right. Then this here is muscularis externa. This is the longitudinal band. This is the circular band. Right. Then this again is uh, still duodenal tissue. If you look at the epithelium, there are spaces where you have goblet cells there. So it's no longer a homogeneous epithelium like in the stomach. It's heterogeneous, simple columnar cells interspersed with goblet cells in between, right? Then this is lamina propria. That's lamina propria, right? So these are villi now, right? Folds of lamina propria into the epithelium, right? Right over there, those are your glands. Right. This is still the muscular mucosa that I was showing uh, on the previous slide. Right. Right. Take a moment to pause again and guess. This is the jejunum. Right. The jejunum, this year is its muscular externa. This is muscular externa. This is submucosa. Folds of submucosa into the mucosa in the intestine, we call them plica circularis. So that's a plica. That's a plica. Right. So easy to identify using these things. Right. Then let's do the same thing here. Yeah? This is muscularis mucosa. These are the glands and the lamina propria. Right. That's the epithelium. Right. Then this here shows the striated border due to the presence of microvilli. Right. That's a goblet cell right over there. That's another goblet cell there. That's another goblet cell there. Remember, I said the epithelium is heterogeneous. Right. This is ileal tissue. Probably you may not have guessed that correctly, but it is typified by the abundance of lymphoid tissue here. So this that's a lymphoid nodule, that's a lymphoid nodule, that's a lymphoid nodule right there. Right. Out here, this is the muscularis externa. Right. That's muscularis externa right over there. Right. Then this will be the submucosa. Right. Then the other characteristics, they remain the same. This is submucosa into the mucosa to form the plica in your, in your uh, ileum. But remember, the plica and the ileum are going to be spaced. Right? These are glands, that's a gland, that's a gland, that's a gland. They open into that duct. Right? If you look at this insert here, that's a gland again. That's another gland right over there. Right? And all this becomes muscularis uh, mucosa. Right. This is colonic tissue. This is the large bowel. This is going to be the mucosa. Right. That's the mucosa right over there. Right. Then this is submucosal tissue. 
this is muscularis externa. Right. This is the longitudinal layer. That's the circular layer, the one more on the inside. The mid one is high magnification. Um, this is submucosal tissue. And this band here, that's muscularis mucosa. This is lamina propria. Then that's the epithelium. Right. Um, that's a gland right over there. Then high magnification. You can appreciate the presence of numerous goblet cells. That's a goblet cell, that's a goblet cell, that's a goblet cell. Also, yeah, those are goblet cells. All those, they're goblet cells within, within your, um, your colonic epithelium. This is the lamina propria. This right over here becomes your muscularis mucosa. Right. Then this is appendix tissue. That's a lymphoid nodule there. Those are all lymphoid nodules. If you haven't watched the videos on lymphoid histology, uh, do find your way there. Those are lymphoid nodules. Right. That's the lumen. The epithelium is there. Oh, that is the epithelial lining. Right. And all this becomes submucosa. And on the outside there, you have muscularis externa as well as serosa because remember the appendix is intraperitoneal. All that on the outside will be serosa. This is the muscularis externa. And remember the longitudinal layer will be continuous in the, in the appendix, unlike for the cecum and your ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, uh, where they form the tinea coli. Right. This here is a lymphoid nodule again with a geminal center at the center there. This is the muscularis externa. That's a blood vessel right over there. That's a blood vessel as well. This is in the submucosa, right? Then this is um, where you have um, the glands in your, um, in your appendix. Then this here is um, anal canal tissue, where we say the epithelium becomes stratified squamous. So right over here, this is stratified squamous epithelium, the anal canal. This here is a lymphoid nodule with a geminal center, of course. Right. Then what else can we show here? This right here. This tissue where you have lymphoid nodule there, then there is this tissue on this side and this tissue on this side. Right? These are sphincters. Right? From the junction where this tissue was taken from. So this is external anal sphincter. This is internal anal sphincter. Right? They're simply sphincters. Right? Then This is still the stratified squamous epithelium, typifying the lower half of the anal canal. Other texts describe this transition from the simple collamina to stratified squamous as occurring at the rectal anal junction, where they believe there is the pectinate line. This is muscle tissue. This would be the muscularis mucosa. This would be the surface epithelium, which is stratified squamous. Those are going to be the glands in your anal canal. Right. That's just about it. Thank you for watching.